Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, and today's hypertrophy myth is that you must train to failure in order to grow your best, you to grow the most muscles and experience the most happiness. Let's talk about the myth. Let's talk about some of the good points that kind of alludes to the bad stuff that makes it mythical, and then some real talk at the end to make sure we're all on the same page. So the myth is expressed in various ways, quite often I will add, on the socials, as at least Australians say. If you're Australian, please confirm that that's what you call social media. Me, I'd like to call it social and media, or SNM for short. Anyone? No one? Let me know in the comments if that's sunk in. All right. So, people will say that if you're not going to failure, you're leaving growth in the tank. Why leave growth in the tank? All right. People say that failure training is key, especially in advanced lifters. Beginners, they can get away with whatever. You got to go to failure if you're advanced, okay? Or failure training is especially a good idea in beginners because a beginner really doesn't know how far from failure he is and needs to be taught to go to failure within the first several weeks of training so that he doesn't spend time, you know, swimming around a little mini duck pond where he could be in the ocean catching these failure growth waves or whatever. Two other points, which Scott, the video guy, and I just discussed comically, is in the same comment section, in the same video or Instagram post, or even better, TikTok post, or even better, fuck swipe post. You'll have people saying that natties, natural lifters, have to train to failure, unlike those lazy, stupid steroid addict fucks that can just get away with pushing the needle into the ass. Natties have to go to failure because they have to earn the shit the hard way. And in that exact same thread, mere three or four comments down, you'll have another mentally not outstanding individual or someone who just charitably hasn't thought this through saying that while only steroid people can recover from training to failure, and that's not how natties should train, natties need to do reps in reserve. It is funny to me that those two people can be in the same comment section. And it's kind of like uh, my fantasy is that I would like to see those two people meet in real life. And, uh, well, you know, in a terrarium and with a cheering crowd around and uh, Roman style gladiator weapons and just, just go to town. Another one of those good fights. Yeah, we should get like a Roman Cosmodrome thing to really bring the gladiator shit back, but, but no MMA shit. Uh, fighters, MMA fighters are too good. I can't relate to how they fight. I'm a regular people, but jilted regular people. Here's another act we're billing, act, fight to the death. Same thing. It's all for the crowd. Vegan versus carnivore. SJW versus ultra Trump MAGA conservative. Scott, what else we got? Pineapple on pizza versus no pineapple. Pineapple on pizza versus everyone else? You get the idea. Dinosaur versus mechanical spider from Wild Wild West? All right. Fuck this video. In the comments below, I'll get back to this shit in a sec. In the comments below, type in anything versus anything else, and it better be fucking good. The a most upvoted comment will get to feel good about being most upvoted. What are we putting in this fucking mega terrarium? 1v1. All right. So anyway, the myth is like people should be trained to failure because reasons. Now, there are some good reasons. If you're intermediate or advanced, at least some of the time you should be trained to failure or very close to failure because it's the definition of hard. And how do you know you're training close to failure if you never really push it to failure and test the boundaries? You really can't. So instead of pretending you're doing two or three RIR, but it's really six or seven RIR, you want to maybe every mesocycle or every two at the very end of the mesocycle in the last training week, as you've made training harder and harder, right before the deload, you might be interested in going really all the way to failure to, hey, get a great stimulus. It's okay about the fatigue because we get to rest the week after. And at the same time, you are going to be able to test the waters. And like, you know, if you got sets of 10, 10, 10, 10, and you thought they were two or one RIR, and then you go to failure and you get a set of 16. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. I was seven reps away from failure. I've been lying to myself. That's why I've been growing like shit. So then later you can come back to that workout and do sets of 13 or 14 to make sure you really are as close to failure as you are. So great shit testing. So there's some good stuff to go in close to failure. 
it's not all like train like it was all the time. Now, here's the bad stuff of trying to get everyone to train to failure all the damn time. First, beginners grow super well from far away from failure training anyway. Eight, seven, six, five reps away from failure is a great place to train beginners for two reasons. One, their thresholds for growth are so low, they get damn near maximum growth for barely even trying. That's the noob stage. You don't have to beat the shit out of your joints and out of your mind and go into psycho failure and having, you know, vomiting blood between sets because you can just get the easy gains. Why not get them while they're there? Second reason is that the most important thing you can do with beginners, short of training them a little bit uh, in a tough way to get them gains, is to help them learn proper lifting technique. And proper lifting technique cannot be learned in an environment in which you're pushing them really close to failure, because especially with beginners in whom technique is not ingrained yet, their technique will break down the closer they get to failure. So if you stop them at three or four reps in reserve before they start to be all wobbly or just as they're starting to get wobbly, you're good to go. They're learning great technique and getting great gains. If you insist that they go to failure all the time, the last couple reps of bench press turn into like the bar goes like this and their one leg comes up when they do this shit, struggling for survival, they hit the fucking rack, bounces off, hit their dick, bounces off. That's not good training. And it sets up really poor habits and it'll get them hurt eventually when they get strong enough. So we don't want to do that with beginners for sure. Now, the second thing is that the body of literature as a whole says that roughly two or three reps in reserve is the best for growth over the course of a training program. The body of literature as, uh, as a whole is conducted mostly on people who are not very well trained or hardly trained at all. There's a term called recreationally trained, which means they've been training for like two or three years, like three or four times a week. There's another term called untrained in which like you ask them, have you ever lifted weights before? And they're like, once in high school. And you're like, great, okay, so you're untrained. Those are most of the folks we study and how we develop that knowledge to say, hey, two or three RIR is really what uh, is the best. And you could say, well, hold, that's, sh that's shitty external validity. How are we applying this to people who are like more jacked, like us, like me, like you? Well, at least you, maybe not me. But hold on a second. We're actually underestimating it because from these studies, if it's two or three, let's say two RIR is the best and zero RIR failure is a little bit worse. In reality, you're saying, but hold on, everyone's not going close to failure as they think. Maybe the two RIR people are really at five RIR and the zero RIR people at really two RIR. Fine. But the five RIR motherfuckers are still getting better gains, bro. Explain that shit. So if you're saying failure really is underrated and, and the studies don't pick it up, how the fuck? If it was underrated, then the failure people would for sure grow way more than the fucking RIR people because they would be at two RIR in reality. The failure people, the RIR people would be at five RIR and two is so much closer to failure than five. It would have to make a big growth impact, but it doesn't. So holy shit, there is just not really any compelling evidence that training to failure is remotely needed in most cases. Close to failure is a great idea. At failure, if you really insist that going to failure is a must, you are saying a dogmatic thing that borders on a religious thing. Yes, I know Dorian Yates. Yes, Midlands, England. Yes, JP. All those cool accents and telling you you're a pussy. Amazing. I love it. I got all the time in the world for that shit. That's when we put our feeling hat on and have feelings. When we put our take our feelings hat off and put our thinking hat on, um, then we start to realize like, wait a minute, none of that shit really makes a whole lot of sense or at least a limited amount of sense. Here's the thing about failure training. The SFR, stimulus to fatigue ratio, a failure training sucks. The raw stimulus magnitude of going to failure is the highest it could be. The raw amount of growth you get in one session going to failure versus not failure, you get more growth for sure. The problem is you get so much fatigue generated from going to failure rather than just a little bit before failure, it's way more fatigue than you get stimulus. So you may get 15% more growth, but two times the amount of fatigue. That fatigue spills over into the next workout, adds up even more, into the next week, adds up even more, into the next several weeks, adds up even more, and you end up having shitty quality training and sort of just fall apart. It is not sustainable because its stimulus to fatigue ratio is not that good. That's not ideal. If, on the other hand, your training volume 
is a really low, like you're capable of doing 10 sets at two RIR, but you normally just train with five sets because you're like a hit person, high intensity training person. Yes, going to failure boosts your hypertrophy closer to that 10 RIR or 10 sets at two RIR situation. And then it actually does make sense for you to go really close to failure. That's a shitty reason to do it because you could just not be a hit advocate and be a normal fucking person and do 10 sets like everybody else. But you could be in a situation in which you're just too busy. You have a lot on your plate. You can only train a few times a week for 45 minutes at a time. You can only do a few sets per muscle group. Then yes, grind everything to fucking failure and maybe even some forced reps because you don't have to worry about the fatigue. You don't train enough for cumulative fatigue to really be a huge factor and you need as big of a stimulus from every set as possible. Yes, that is, is true. That is a thing. But if you training for optimal hypertrophy and you're doing as many sets as needed, it's better to do the average two RIR over the meso with as many sets as between your minimum effective volume and your maximum recoverable. More like three to 10 sets per session per um, per workout and, and not like just two or something like that or one set to failure or some crazy shit. Um, at the end of a mezzo, it is a good idea to go very close to failure and I absolutely think you should do it in most cases. But every session, that's a bit of a stretch. Lastly, do advanced folks need to go closer to failure or to failure to grow. On the one hand, maybe, because they need such a big raw stimulus magnitude, nothing else cuts it at that point. Maybe. So if you're advanced, you may be able to benefit from going very close to failure, if not to failure, more often. On the other hand, for you, you're so big and so strong and so close to your genetic ceiling as an advanced lifter that the stimulus to fatigue ratio of going to failure is even worse. And then it's less sustainable, so maybe it's an argument for you going further from failure. I have no idea which one of those is true. The literature is rather equivocal on them. So my personal current tentative hypothesis and the way I train myself is just assume it's about the same as for intermediates. I don't know that for sure. It's an open question. Let me know what you think in the question below and let's see if we can sift your comments out from all the other stupid shit we talked about today. Folks, if you want more sciencey shit, nerd shit, uh, subscribe to our channel. There's a, oh, sorry, uh, join the member section. It's just a little bit of money and you get a shitload more videos. Uh, super consistent about that. We're never going to charge you for these videos here on the main channel. We're never reducing our main channel frequency to rip you off. I've heard a couple guys being like, yeah, man, I can't believe they started charging for videos. No, dumb motherfucker. We did not start charging for videos. We give you the same number, even more videos than before for free. And then we also put in extra other videos that you can charge for and uh, where you can pay for. And if you don't want to pay for them, word up. No worries. You're not losing out on anything. But if you really want some more shit, check that out. Like, comment, subscribe, tell your friends to subscribe, tell your enemies to subscribe, call up grandma. Hey, grandma, how are you? Great, that's nice. Subscribe to Renaissance Periodization YouTube. I'll see you guys next time.